Hello, how are you? Greetings from afar. I hope you're doing great. Welcome to today's program. Have a nice evening or afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. On behalf of Badminton Pan America, I'd like to welcome you to our Coach Corner program. My name is Adrián Gómez Calvo, and I will join you as the moderator of this session to our English and French speaking community. Please find the simultaneous interpretation function at the bottom of your screens. Today, we have the pleasure of having one of the most prominent coaches of, Panam, of the Panam region. I'm talking about Coach Martin Trejos, who will talk about his experience as a coach in the preparation of the youth team, its process and its pathway for the Argentinian team. Before leaving you with the speaker, I'd like to summarize a little bit about our guest's career. He is Argentinian. He participated in the Youth Olympic Games Buenos Aires 2018. He also participated in the Panam Games Lima 2019, as well as the Oresur Games in Cochabamba, Brazil in 2018. He has participated as a coach in the training camps with high-performance athletes. He is also certified by the BWF as a coach level 2. Before we continue with our speaker, I'd also like to mention some regulations that we'll have in this session. Please, if you have any questions or comments, we invite you to write them down in the chat box located on the right side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. We recommend using headphones for a better quality sound. And to those listening to the simultaneous interpretation, please mute the original audio. Without further ado, let's welcome Coach Martin Trejos. Good afternoon, Martin. Welcome to our program. Thank you for sharing with our audience and welcoming us to your home over there in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Good afternoon, Adrián. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for the quality of the presentation. First of all, I would like to thank the PANAM confederation that has given me the space. I would also like to thank the Argentinian Federation. I work with, for them and they allowed me to be present today. And finally, I would like to thank all teachers who make some time in order to listen to me. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to share the presentation that I prepared for today. So just give me a second. There you go. Well, perfect. Today, I'm going to talk about my experience in planning young athletes, junior athletes. In the first part of this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we in Argentina detect talent. We do that first early detection of athletes and after the trivia, which will be very interesting, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I work with the athletes, with the players that I have to train in the national team in the high performance center that we have here in Buenos Aires. So I hope that this talk is fruitful for everyone and let's get started. The first measure that we did and I wanted that I wanted to talk about is the YOG program that we have here in Argentina that is promoted by in art by the National High Performance Sports Agency that works together with federations and these YOG or YOG program began in the year 2014. 
team because we wanted to uh, organize the Young Olympic Games in Buenos Aires 2018. So this talent detection program was focused on athletes that were born between the years 2000 and 2003. And back then, the athlete selection system that we used was a selective tournament system that included different phases and obviously after the phases went by the, this group of athletes became smaller and smaller both in men and women well at the end of this of this system or of this program the idea was to find an athlete or athletes that were able to represent Argentina in the Youth Olympic Games that were going to be held in Buenos Aires 2019. This is just a very basic summary of what this program was about. Obviously, it had a lot more details, but there's no time to tell you about them all. But basically, I can draw two reflections based on this. The first one, which is the one I want to focus on in this conference, and that's if the, res the question is, the result, is it the only factor to take into account when selecting an athlete in early ages, or maybe we have to include uh, more people here? And another, or more factors, and another thing that's also really important in this process is creating training groups and not focus only on two or three athletes or the best players that we have in the team. I think that it's important to create teams and working groups, whether they're players or coaches. Well, what I'm going to show you here is just an example, a specific example of the progression of two athletes that currently keep on playing. The first one is Mateo del Mastro. Mateo is 20 years old nowadays, and he's a former player. Sorry, he, he used to play in Bariloche, in the southern area of Argentina, in the Patagonia. And in the year 2017, he came to live to Buenos Aires. And actually, it was because of this program of talent selection. That's how he passed all the different phases uh, uh, successfully after all of these selection tournaments. So he came to leave to the High Performance Center. So he passed all the different phases that were imposed by this program. And in the year 2018, he represented Argentina in the Youth Olympic Games. Nowadays, in the year 2020, he is still living in the high performance center that we have here in Argentina called Senat. So he keeps training with us and he's doing his transition towards the adulthood. So he's no longer a junior player, but he's still young. So he's still in that transition stage. All right. The second example that I wanted to show you is the one of Nicolas Oliva in the year 2016. Well, Nicolás is from Buenos Aires. In the year 2016, he was included in the national team. So he began training with me, basically, before he used to train in a club that was also part of the city of Buenos Aires. And he passed all the different pieces of this program, all the selections, and in the last phase, well, he was not selected, uh, Mateo was. But nowadays, he keeps playing. I think that he's one of the athletes that has the best projection or one of the athletes that has one of the most uh, the best futures to come in the national team. And he's a high 
he was chosen to play in the Pan Am Games in Lima. I just wanted to show you these two examples. I thought that it was good for you to see two specific examples of two players who made progress and be, who began with this program and how nowadays they keep playing as part of the Argentinian national team. Well, after the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires were held, that cycle ended and in the year 2019 a new cycle began. Obviously, this was for the Youth Olympic Games Dakar 2022. This program included different changes both at the national level, also internally speaking within the Federation, we decided to have a different type of approach. Obviously, one of the main objectives is to try to find athletes who are able to, to classify to the Olympic Games I think that there are two aspects that are fundamental. The first one is to increase the competitive, the pool of competitive athletes that we have nationwide in order to have a bigger national competition with better quantity and better quality. And on the other hand, something that's also fundamental is to increase and renew the pool of players in the national team. Those are the two that are in red. So it's not just about finding one or two good kids, but actually to form working groups. And that's related to the reflection that I did in on the first slide. So basically, in regards to talent detection, so to speak, the first thing that we found was that they had to be athletes born between the year 2004 or and 2007. Now, the detection focuses that we found were among the population of players who were part of a federation, maybe a club that is registered or that is part of the National Badminton Federation in Argentina that who compete in national regional tournaments. And the second detection focus that we had, which we found quite interesting and that has been quite fruitful to us, especially in, since the year 2018 until nowadays, is in the Evita National Games. These are the games in which pretty much every sport is included in Argentina, except for a few. We have players who represent pretty much every region in Argentina, and actually this is a week, a one-week tournament where we can see many boys and girls, obviously, and they don't need to be associated to the National Federation of Argentina. So our vision opens up a little bit more. Finally, it's also important to work with the program of sports initiation schools, the sports secretariat, the National Sports Secretariat is part of this, and it's really important to be in touch with the teachers and trainers, and, sorry, coaches, in order to see those players. So, if we added up all of these places that were, where we could actually find the, uh, talents, we saw that we could find talent from different parts of our country because our country is big. So, we were able to see players from different places. Nowadays, just as in the previous cycle, we have a coach in, in chief who whose picture is in the middle of the slide. His name is Paragas. He is the coach that is in charge of um, 
leading this program. The actions that we did in regards to this program basically are four. The first one that we can distinguish is the training campus to do these weekly so, so as to see the kids and actually work with the coaches as well. So these campuses are usually at a regional level because our country is really big. So we have to divide the country per regions. The second thing that's also important is to observe players in both regional and national competitions. As I mentioned before, for example, the Evita National Games at the end of the day, this is really important because you can be following up a player that you're interested in. For example, okay, I think that this girl has certain conditions or certain skills that are interesting for badminton. So you can do a follow-up, but you can also discover new players. Sometimes you are surprised in a positive way, and that's really good as well. Finally, something that's also fundamental is it's not only important for athletes and players to turn up their level, but also it's fundamental for coaches who work these with these players and lead these players. It's also important for them to elevate their abilities and knowledge. And this is something that's fundamental for us as well. Well, now that I've explained what this talent detection program is about, I would like to focus a little bit on what we understand for talent detection, what are the parameters that we take, what we focus on. So first, I would like to talk about the dichotomy, the constant dichotomy that we sometimes have between process and results. These two aspects that are so important in sport, at least in badminton, I think that in the junior stage, what we prioritize above all is the process. It's not so much on, we don't focus so much on results. And why not? Well, for a very simple reason, we consider that at an early age in the juniors category, results are just um, temporarily a sample of the athlete at that point in time. Where is the process? It's a period that lasts longer, and that's when you can actually think about this athlete in the long run. And at an early age, this is fundamental. Okay, so where do I think this athlete will be in the future? So I can project that idea in his different, in his performance. So what's he, what's he lacking? What's he good at? How can I uh, help him? If I just focus on the results, on a specific competition or a series of competitions, it's difficult to actually think about his potential in the future. And this also has to go in hand with the fact that we're also interested in the comprehensive education of these athletes. It's not just about him playing well at the court, but also to have certain habits out of outside the, of the court. Here in Argentina, some coaches call these invisible training. It's about having good habits in terms of nutrition, of resting. Maybe he should learn more about, for example, anti-doping and all of those 
things. At this age, it is where we have to start, from my point of view, you have to start creating those habits in the players that one considers have the ability to represent the country at an international level. Finally, these are some aspects that we observe specifically in a player that we see has potential. We think that it's important to see if this is a player that has a disposition to learn, that this is someone who's curious, who is open to learn. I think that that's always a positive attitude. And this not only help, helps us coaches, but it also helps themselves, the athletes themselves. Also, it's important for athletes to show a willingness to improve, to go beyond the sense of self-improvement, to find new challenges all the time. To me, that's an attitude that I like a lot, to, that I like seeing a lot in players. Another thing is the technical side of things, is to observe how the player understands the game, how they make decisions, how they answer or how they respond to problems or certain situations. So this decision-making process, that's something that actually was mentioned a couple of conferences ago here at Pan Am. Uh, I think it was interesting. Also, um, the observation of specific skills, for example, their technical strengths, the aspects that he, the player needs to work on from a technical point of view, or his game style, and think about this athlete in the future. To think about a specific or a, a given uh, game style. And based on that, also think about how his physical preparation should be like. I think that it's quite interesting. And that we need to develop in an athlete, at least I like that a lot. Obviously, we have to see how the athlete develops in competition, not only see if the player actually wins or not, or what his results are, but I also like seeing how this athlete responds in, com in a competitive scenario. How does he deal with pressure when he's about to lose, or if he's losing by six points, or he's dominating the, the rally, and he has many points more, he has a lot more points in comparison to his rival. Or if, the, if there's a tie, let's say like 2020 in the third set. So I want to see how the, the athlete um, deals with those types of situation. I think that's really important also observe competitions but this is not just about looking at what's going on in the rally but also how the uh, player uh, behaves outside of the court and finally observe his environment what's his environment like if this environment stimulates him if it's uh, appropriate for uh, the practice of badminton or not well, to finish before the trivia that we have for today, these are some of the actions that we carried out last year and well, part of this year as well before the pandemic uh, made us stop uh, temporarily, of course. Well, these are some camps that we have with some foreign coaches like Martin that we had the pleasure of receiving in Argentina and some other camps that we had in our country. Well, now we have a trivia and a short coffee break. Adrian, you're up. Thank you very much, Martin. Your talk is quite interesting. I already have some questions for you. Well, we also invite you to participate in the trivia. 
where we're going to test your knowledge and our audience's knowledge of badminton, of Pan Am badminton. So please write your answers in the chat box. The question is, which athletes obtained the gold medal in the Lima 2019 Pan Am Games in men's singles SL4, women's singles WH2, and men's singles SH6. SH so let's give it a minute. We see the audience is already answering. There are, we can see the answers there. Let's see, let's give it 20 more seconds. Oh, great. We have Ricardo Salamanca also participating. Riz is also participating. Thank you very much, Manuel Quiroz. Mohan, thank you very much as well. All right. Martin, Martin, have you already bet? Have you already placed your bet? What's your answer? I think that Peru. Well, let's see the answers. I think it's option B. Okay, muy bien. So the answers, the answer for our trivia was actually option B. Men's singles in SL4, the famous Raul Anguiana from, from Guatemala, in women's singles wheelchair 2, Pilar Jauregui from Peru, and men's singles in SS6, Victor Tavares from Brazil. Well, congratulations to the winners. I can tell that you have been studying Pan American badminton. So let's continue, Martin. Thank you, Adrian. Well, I'm going to share the screen again. One second, please. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. There you go. Well, in this second section, I'm going to focus more on some of the ways or methods that we have to train the national team who trains with me and my colleagues, the other coaches will also work with me. So I hope that this is useful for you. This is supposed to be a, li a little bit more technical, so to speak. So I hope you like it. The first thing that I would like to explain is, well, I would like to make a short summary of the current situation of the badminton national team in Argentina. In the upper part of the slide, you can see, well, this pandemic situation changed things and things are still changing every day, but this was supposed to be our Olympic cycle our Olympic cycle that was supposed to end in Paris 2024. But today we have a young group of athletes who are between 14, 15 years old, well, the youngest ones, and the oldest one is 20, and that's Mateo, actually. So that's the range of ages that we have in our national team. One of the positive things that we got uh, in comparison of in comparison with the previous cycle is that the um, technical team is different in this new cycle, which I think is also really important because now this allows me to delegate more on them and there is a link of trust and there's constant feedback. It's not just about giving feedback to athletes, but also between us uh, coaches. One of the things that I'd also like to mention is that we set a series of objectives for this cycle. 
For example, it could be to improve our general performance in the next Pan Am Games in Santiago. And, well, also given the situation and after doing some appropriate analysis, we could also think about a possible classification for the Olympic Games. I also consider that for um, Argentina and badminton, this would be a, this would we would be making history. Well, the National Federation has the support of different agencies who are based uh, in the National Federation of Argentina. Well, these different agencies, in general terms, include the Argentinian Olympic Committee the High Performance Center, the uh, Pan Badminton Panam, with all the camps that they organize, it's a constant support that they give us, and this has been helping us a lot. And finally, the Ministry of Sports from Argentina with its Sports Secretariat, who's also a great support for us. <coughs> Well, nowadays the national team in Argentina is Senard, which is the National High Performance Sports Agency uh, Center. And currently we train from Monday to Friday, 20, between 20 to 25 hours weekly. So we work, all, we work two shifts. We have sessions in the court. These are technical and tactical sessions in the court. We can also uh, do some physical training in the court. We actually do that as well. We also work on strength, and that's done in the gym. We also work in the tracks. You can see the pictures of the three environments that we usually use for training. And we also work on the psychological aspect, which is fundamental for everyone, including myself, of course. Well, what we're going to do now well, I want to show you how we develop each area, each training area. So we can distinguish four areas, so to speak. The physical area, the technical, tactical area, the mental training or psychological training area, and the personal area. So we're going to check out each one of these areas. Well, the first thing that we find here is the personal area, all right? So here we focus on what happens with the athlete outside of the court. We were talking about the comprehensive training of the athlete. Well, in high performance, this is really important because if the athlete is doing fine, if the athlete is doing fine, then everything flows, everything's a lot better. So we focus on this. As you can see on the left side of the screen, you can see the environment. So working a lot with the families, make sure that they are surrounded by healthy environments, uh, which who are related to uh, sport practice in badminton practice. Another thing that's important is that the athletes that are part of the national team um, study online, and that helps them to train uh, two shifts and to travel for competitions and so on and so forth. So the school um, is adapted to their training. This, and um, the program of the University of Buenos Aires actually helps a lot in that because they have their own program and that helps the athletes to um, do their homework uh, at some point of the week because the week has 168 hours. So it's important for athletes to use the time wisely. Also, uh, we try to have an appropriate nutrition. So we, the center that we have, we have a staff of doctors, of, of physicians who include, 
who includes um, nutritionists. So we do a follow-up of this area. So they are healthy. This is one of the things that we focus on, and that's the personal area. Talking about the psychological training or mental training, we have four specific actions. The first one, the first thing that I want to clarify is that this part of the training is guided or led by a psychologist. I mean, I don't lead these. This is important to clarify right from the batch. The first thing that we do is a, an evaluation and a follow, a, a individual follow up of each player. So each one of the athletes need to needs to talk with a psychologist, uh, whether about topics that can be related to the sport, but also any personal topic. The second thing that you can see on the right side is. Um, well, once every two weeks or every three, 10 days, we have a recreational space in which we have some games that help motivate the, the group and make um, athletes work as a group. And this is fundamental in at the at junior level because I think that badminton even though it can be played as singles, the fact that the kids are feel that are part of a group, I think that teenagers um, have a better self-esteem and they trust themselves a lot better, uh, whether they are performing uh, individually or as a group. And these games are also interesting because you can see their relationships or the relation that they have with each other, how they bond with each other. And I think that this also has uh, consequences uh, when they do well or not in competitions. The third action, the third activity that we do, and you can see on the left side is, well, the training itself of this area. Here, there you can see a photo of kids who are meditating sometimes we can also do some training in the court with a specific intention, for example, okay, we're going to do a competition exercise and to and, and try to notice specific aspects of a specific athlete that we want to work with. And finally, what you see on the upper left corner is a player that's not sleeping or angry or anything like that. He's, well, he's actually Mateo. And he was doing an, a visualization exercise before warming up to compete. All right. So I took this picture in Ecuador last year. He didn't realize that I was taking this picture, but well, you cannot really tell, but he he was using his cell phone. So um, the psychologist had given, had sent him some uh, audios so he would um, prepare himself mentally. And that helped him a lot. Well, now let's talk about the physical area. We can do this in the court uh, in, or in the tracks or in the gym and one of the things that we also want to do with players but we weren't able to do so this year because of the pandemic well we wanted to test the um, maximum oxygen consumption and with this test we would be able to identify the heart um, performance of the athletes that's what you can see in the graph and we measure this with the devices from polar i think that martin talked about this in one of his conferences well we use these uh, devices that are not that expensive i think that it's affordable uh, for most of us well, if you are interested, this is Polar HPS. That's the model that we use. And finally, well, we have the technical tactical area. 
For example, in the BWF coaches book, the technical and tactical factors are, um, well, there's a lot of information and I didn't have much time, so I tried to put it all together in here. But the main goal of this area is to set an individual profile of each one of the players. So in order to do this, what we do in terms of the technical area, well, this depends on two aspects in general. One is the height in which the athlete uh, hits the shuttlecock and the area of the court that he's playing in. So these are the two conditions that, from my point of view, always condition the analysis. And what you can observe here is a lot of things, but in general terms, you can observe the footwork uh, with different rhythms when playing. For example, when the player is um, just defending or offending, I mean, hitting the shuttle over the net. We can also observe how the player, or actually the ability of the player to do different strokes from one same area of the court. Many times uh, we train the athletes so they can actually make the right stroke, but that's not that cannot be predicted. And I think that if this is something that you teach players at an early age, it's 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 great because if players drag this mistake until they get older, then uh, they will make shot strokes that are predictable and that's that's terrible. Also, we see the combination of different strokes in different parts of the air of the, of the court, how the player uh, answers creating different footwork patterns. I think that's important. Talking about the cognitive aspect, I mean, the tactical aspect. There are three factors that condition this situation. One is the rival, the opponent. The second is the physical part. It's not the same to make a decision. If you are 20-20 in a third set, it's not the same as making a decision as being in a tie in the first set, or if you're 5-5. Five, five. And this also takes uh, brings uh, the physical part. It's not the same thing to make a decision if you are tired in comparison to a situation in which you are more relaxed. And I think that the physical and the psychological uh, sides from this point of view are closely related. And one of the issues that I would like to focus on is, first of all, decision making. The player needs to interpret where, uh, from which area he is playing, the trajectory of the shuttlecock that is coming towards him, if it's straight, if it's uh, if it's a cross, a cross uh, stroke, he needs to have a vision of uh, the opponent and make a decision based on all of this. Well, there are many variables that are part of this area. The other thing that it's also important to consider is the rally creation. Players need to look for a, an open space to do deceptions. It's important for them not to be repetitive, not to have uh, specific patterns, because that will make them predictable. Also to see how an athlete executes a game plan, how he carries it out. I think that's also really important. And uh, I think that it's related to the discipline of an athlete. Another thing that's also important is that at the same time that this athlete needs to have a game plan, he has to consider that his opponent 
can realize what his game plan is. So this athlete needs to leave his comfort zone and change his game plan into a more conservative game plan or to a more um, challenging uh, one. I think that it's important for athletes to have that ability. And finally, the anticipation. I also think that it's important to see and develop, actually, this ability in athletes. Finally, before we finish, I'd like to mention this other aspect that is used a lot, and I think that this tool is quite uh, important, is the video analysis in addition. We actually use a Dartfish software, and in video analysis, we can... Well, we can use this for technical or tactical observation. For example, everything that we have been talking about uh, right now. For example, this is a tournament in Lima that was held in March. That was the last tournament we played. But we also use this software to see certain game trends or the same volumes. For example, the table that you see down there is a way that, uh, in which we group uh, strokes from the Rivas, who's a coach. Um, well, he groups the strokes. And I think that, well, I really like the way he does this. And I think that this is very useful. And this is one of the variables that we observe in high performance in order to um, create these work volumes, for example, the total uh, game time, the average time, the shortest stro uh, rally, the longest one, the total number of strokes, the average of strokes, and based on all of this, you can see what you require. Well, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what we do in this area. Well, I think I, I would like to thank uh, Badminton Panam, the, Fed, the Federation from Argentina, and all the audience, uh, especially the Argentinians who are listening, and all the athletes and the coaches who work with me. Uh, who well they are fundamental without them i mean I, I wouldn't be able to be here and thank you at the end as well you're a good moderator thank you martin your presentation was quite interesting and now let's move to our q a please if you have any questions or experience you'd like to share Write de them down in the chat box. Well, Martin, it's quite interesting. And actually, I already have several questions. But before asking them, first, I would like to say that you, the people from Peru are sending their greetings. Surely from the Dominican Republic also, Mr. Generoso is also saying hi. Who's, he has joined us. Also, people from Guatemala and a lot of people from Argentina who are following you. Well, among the things that you mentioned, Martin, I wanted to ask you, what were the biggest obstacles you encountered when beginning this process? As a coach, which were the obstacles that you felt were the strongest, the most difficult ones that you had to face? Well, actually, the first thing that I think I had to face was to convince that group of athletes who began working with me, but also to earn my place there, uh, I mean, in terms of the leadership. I think that that was also really important. Uh, after that, well, I, I also think that I was very lucky in my short career in this world. I mean, I began, at an, I started at a very early age and I was very lucky. But yes, basically, I think that, I don't know if I should call this an obstacle, but a challenge. The fir My first challenge was to convince 
the players. I think that that was a challenge. Well, well, there's a lot to say, but I don't like thinking about what I don't have because I could say, for example, Argentina is a country that is uh, going through uh, economic situation that it's not so good. I think that that would be the easiest answer. Okay, the lack of resources or the lack of competition or and so on and so forth. But I like to focus a lot on what I have and not on what I lack. And whatever I have, I try to maximize it as much as I can. I don't know if I answer the question. Yes, I think that, well, I also agree with you, we also have to look towards the future regardless of the obstacles, and that's what makes you grow and mature as a coach. There's another excellent question here. What type of work did you do with the coaches? Because you mentioned that in the process you also worked with the coaches of the kids that you selected and that you approached them you had some consultants so I would like to know what type of work you did well the first thing that we do with the coaches well for example when, whenever we detect one of the kids one of these kids, the first thing that we do is contact the coach and make a work plan to try to ha to do a technical consultancy. I personally think that that's something that is um, more valued nowadays in the Argentinian f Federation. I mean, to have a program to um, coach coaches. And this work is about to come, or was about to come. But, well, basically what we do with coaches who have, how can I say this? Coaches who have athletes that we are interested in, well, we consult with them and we set technical working plans with them in regards to that athlete. I don't know if I answered your question. I also think, Martin, that what's important is to um, it's important to train not just a coach, but a group of coaches and those who are going to represent a country. As you mentioned, that's how you make everyone cooperate and work towards uh, the same goal. Yes, there will always be differences because there will always people will always think differently, and I think that that's very positive actually. But I think that you have to have priorities. So whenever you're talking about these type of situations in which your flag, your country comes first, well, there are priorities and the priorities is to represent your country, like in this case, Argentina. Because in my case, well, I have to talk about Argentina. But yeah, it, that's important. And also to make working groups and not work individually because it's very difficult to achieve something, to, to achieve a specific goal if you work on your own. Yeah, you can make progress, of course, but when you make working teams, working groups, the progress is a lot better. Excellent. Another question is, Martin, what characteristics do you take into account when selecting the athletes? You already mentioned some, right? Uh, watching them in tournaments, but did you have a specific method or some other characteristics to select them or the age in general? Well, the age is one condition because, well, these YOG or YOG program that encourages uh, the kids or promotes the kids in high performance. In, within the federation, um, because this is an Olympic sport. Um, well, for for the Dakar program, 
I think that it began in the year 2004 until the year 2007. Oh, they have to be born between the year 2004 and 2007. That's the condition that we have. The second thing is, well, we select them based on the observation, but it's not just about, hey, I like this athlete, uh, and that's it. No, there are certain parameters that we take into account. For example, we observe the kids the players. I say kids because they're quite young. They're 12 or 13 years old. The, the oldest ones are 14, I think. And well, those are the parameters that uh, we are interested in. And those are the ones that I mentioned, basically. There's not much more than that. Okay, Martin. And the question is, in this process that uh, you followed, the agreement that you had with schools was negotiated by your federation alone, or was it together with the Olympic um, Committee uh, of your country? Right. When I talk about schools, actually, I'm not talking about um, like schools per se. We have a program called Sports Initiation Schools that is promoted by uh, the National Federation in Argentina. And the idea is to bring sports to people. So it's a mo more of a development program. And its function is to be able to install or to install a school, what we call schools, in a specific uh, in specific parts of the country, like, for example, these can these schools can be related to badminton, and this can be assigned by the National Federation, and we assign a specific group of athletes to them, or it can also be assigned to the different provinces of Argentina. So, um, basically, well, this program also has a coach that is in charge of it. So there is a specific coach in charge of this program, so there's like a head coach. So basically, the ones who are part of this program is the National Federation of Argentina, who appoints this head coach, and the National um, Sports Agency of Argentina that depend on this and well, yeah, that's a lot of work, actually. Yes. Uh, who is asking, what should a coach take into account at the very beginning? Because we've talked about coaches who are undergoing that process. So three things that you would suggest. Well, I don't have 30 years of experience in badminton, so I'm always embarrassed of giving advice, but, but you have a lot of experience. Well, not that much, but well, the first thing that I would say is to be curious, to try to, to always try to learn. I think that that's important, to give yourself some time or create time if you don't have it in your everyday life and to invest in learning. I think that that's something that should be part of every coach to see, okay, 10% of my paycheck or 15% of my paycheck, I'm, I'm going to save the money and I'm going to invest it in case there is some, um, some uh, training program that I can join later on, and that will always have a positive retribution. And the second thing that I also think it's important is to always try not to impose yourself. The first thing is to be yourself, to show yourself as you are. Not try to pretend to be someone that you're not. If you are not stricter, if you are more of a mediator, don't try to be so strict because the people that you're leading, I mean, the group of athletes that you are leading will realize that and you will lose your credibility. So you have to be yourself and show yourself as you are. I think that those are some of the things that you have to take into account and to talk, talk with people.
to have an open dialogue, to ask athletes, hey, how are you doing? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? So athletes can actually be part of their planning so they can feel that they are part of it. Perfect. Well, I just want to highlight that I I have had the chance to see your work and to be in the court with you and your kids in a couple of competitions. Well, we've run into each other and I always see how your kids um, play with each other as a team whenever they bring their materials to the court and when they have to take them outside of the court as well. So any advice that you can give us, how did you make your kids be more cooperative? Look, the first thing that I'm going to say, and I heard Marco Asconso say this, actually. First thing is the athlete. And I also believe that if they don't have that willingness to, to work like that, I mean, that's it. So the first thing is their own, for, their own disposition to do it. And the other thing is, well, I think that there are some times in which you have to be a leader and other times in which you have to, I mean, to say, okay, we're going this way or we're going that way and that's it. But I also think that there are times in which you have to turn it down a little bit and don't act like you are just one of their peers because I'm not their friends. Yeah, we can get along and we can trust each other, but there's always a line there. There are boundaries. But there are other times in which you have to be right next to them. Or let's, you, it's not just about saying, hey, go and, uh, and, gather all, and gather all these shuttlecocks. No, I can do it too. We can do it. Let, let's all do it. So if the so they say, hey, if the coach is, is, is um, picking up the shuttles, okay, then we should do it too, right? So you cannot tell an athlete to come on time to training if you are always late. So you have to preach with example. Martin, I have other questions for you here, but time's up again, unfortunately. Well, I don't know if you want to uh, say something before we leave to our audience. Actually, I, I just want to thank Badminton Panam for this space that you have given Argentina to us. This is extremely important. Thank you very much, everyone. And personally speaking, thank you, everyone who at any point in time uh, took their time to teach me or to share some knowledge with me. I, I'm tremendously thankful. Thank you uh, to all the countries that we always go to to compete. We always have find these nice predisposition. Uh, I mean, coaches. I, I'm a, I. I'm afraid of saying colleagues, but to my coaches, thank you. And well, uh, you have uh, my email there on the, la on the last slide. I showed my email. So if you have any questions, please write to me and nothing. Thank you for this space. Thank you very much. Okay, Martin, I would like to thank you for sharing such an interesting talk and sharing your experience with us. As always, it's very enriching to discuss with you whenever we see each other in a competition or in a talk. And I just wanted to thank you for keeping us informed. And to you, our audience, please help us improve the quality of the content of our program by filling out anonymously the poll that you'll see on your screens now. To our badminton family, we invite you to the next session entitled Para Badminton. This talk will be transmitted next Friday, June 3rd, July 3rd, where we'll have the pleasure of having Ram Nayar from Canada. Likewise, in this talk, we will do a raffle among everyone who participated in the trivia 
of the Air Badminton Conference. So we are going to finish this raffle here. So everyone is invited and you'll see the results and the winners. So we invite you to write to us and propose any topic you're interested in. Please write now in the chat box. We also invite you to check out Badminton Panam's YouTube channel where you'll be able to find this and other conferences that we have done for all of you. On behalf of Badminton Panam, we thank you for your participation and we hope you like this session. Greetings and as always, take care and see you soon. Have a nice afternoon.